Hello wonderful Keeper readers, some of you might already know that I love to sneak a little something extra into the paperback versions of my books whenever I can, since I don't think hardcover readers should get to be the only ones who sometimes find fun bonuses. For those who didn't know that, surprise. I knew I wanted to include a story from Rella's POV this time. Not only is she on the cover, looking fierce and fabulous, and a fan favorite character, but she also had some key scenes in Stalaloon that we only got to hear about. The Keeper books are limited to Sophie's POV, so I could only include moments where Sophie is present since Sophie didn't go with Marilla to her meetings with Fenton, we only learn what Marilla tells Sophie later. But what if there was something Marilla didn't share? Over the next few pages, you can watch one of Marilla's conversations with Fenton play out in real time, and hear all Marilla's thoughts and reactions to what's happening. I've called the story, the trade, and I've worked in a lots of fun, little extra details, some of which might even turn out to be important later. Wink! For those wondering, this story is based on a scene in chapter 31 of Stellaloon, and if you haven't read Stellaloon yet, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, reading this first will probably be confusing and will also give away a few tidbits too early. You'll be much happier if you start by reading Stellaloon, and then come back here for all the Marilla fun once you're done. Happy reading. The Trade Marilla. Ugh, I hate this place, Marilla muttered, shaking the freshly fallen snowflakes out of her gilded blonde hair much harder than necessary and yanking her thick velvet cape tighter around her narrow shoulders. She said the same thing every time she had to trudge through the knee-high snowdrifts and found herself staring at the icicle-crusted entrance to the now-familiar cave. Didn't matter how many times she's gone there, or how important her visits were, she was never not going to dread making the long, slippery trek down to Finn's frozen cell. The cave looked like some sort of open-mouthed snow beast waiting to devour everything in its past, which was probably intentional, since the prison was, was designed to be as miserable as possible, especially for someone like her. The goblin guards even gave her pitying stares as they moved aside to reveal the endless icy path that wound down and down and down a whole lot more, to a place where the tiniest glimmer of heat had long since been swallowed up by the suffocating cold. No amount of clothing could keep Marilla warm in the heart of the prison. She'd actually tried wearing so many layers that she looked like an overstuffed gulon, and she still couldn't stop shivering. And the whole body temperature regulation thing wasn't exactly possible when she had to use so much concentration to make sense of Pinton's ranting. It wasn't fair. Everyone else got to train their special abilities in fancy rooms at Foxfire with mentors who weren't creepy, unstable murderers, but they weren't pyrokinetics. Marilla was lucky the council was letting her use her ability at all. They could just as easily label her talentless, kick her out of their snobby academy, and ban her from, from ever sparking another flame. Or they could decide she was too dangerous and lock her away. In fact, Marilla wouldn't have been surprised at all if the council was already building an icy cage just for her. But the thought still made her shiver and wish she could have manifested as, nope, she stopped herself from finishing that sentence. If life had taught her anything, it was that there's no point wanting things that were never going to happen. Instead, she focused on the thin beams of sunlight streaking through a gap in the gloomy gray clouds. The light was far from warm, but if she really concentrated, she could feel a hint of lingering heat tangled among the brightness. She called the warmth closer and soaked it in, let it pool on her skin, pounding with her pulse, swelling with every heartbeat, growing hotter and hotter and hotter until, snap, a flick of her finger sent a small tangle of flame sparkling to life above her left palm. Feel better? Lynn asked as Marilla let out a long slow sigh. Marilla nodded though she definitely could have done without the whispers that were now hissing around her head. The flames had a soft, crackly voice, and they always made the same plea. Feed me. Feed me. Feed me. Fire craved fuel, constantly wanting more, 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 and it would have been so easy for Morella to let the fire swell bigger and bigger and bigger. But that was the kind of thing that would lead to a lifetime of shivering in an underground ice cube. So she forced her gaze to shift to Lynn, who stood in a small snowless circle surrounded by a halo of her hovering snowflakes, none daring to touch her long silver tip hair of shimmering purple cape. Morella knew how hard Lynn had fought to achieve that level of control, and how tentative Lynn's hold over her ability still was. But the fact Lynn could stand in a sea of frozen water and do nothing except keep the falling snow from settling on her flush pink cheeks was very annoying. Then again, everyone annoyed Marilla a little. Her dad used to call her fiery long before he realized how accurate that description truly was. But it wasn't Marilla's fault. People tended to be annoying, especially a hydrokinetic who was currently looking all peaceful and pretty and perfect while making snowflakes flutter and spin in intricate patterns. That didn't mean Marilla was also grateful that Lynn was willing to tag along to her pyrokinetic lessons. It was nice to see a friendly face after hours of Fenton's rant. Plus, it seemed like a good idea to have someone with water powers around while she practiced setting things on fire. They were even finding some pretty cool ways to work together. Fire and water might be opposites, but that didn't mean they couldn't be combined. Marilla actually had figured out a way to ignite Lynn's rain, and she couldn't wait to use that little trick on the never scene, assuming those black cloak losers even showed up again. For a fearsome, unstoppable rebellion, they sure spent a lot of time hiding. Are you going to start by asking him about the cash, or do the lesson first? Lynn asked, reminding Marilla why they were there. Marilla shrugged. 
depending on Finson's mood. Sometimes he was already babbling about some fancy new fire trick when she arrived, as if he started the lesson without bothering to wait for her. Other times, she couldn't get anywhere with him until she'd let him go on and on and on about how foolish the council was, or how badly he'd been wronged, or how much he missed the feel of a flickering flame and she didn't necessarily blame him for the last one. Part of her wanted to hold on to her fireball forever, make it her smoky little pet. Instead, she curled her fingers into a fist and snuffed it out, but she didn't let all the heat dissipate. She called a single tingling glint deeper, letting it sear through her veins and settle into her heart. She knew it was a risky move, even with all the defenses she wrapped around it, but she couldn't bear the cold emptiness of Fenton's prison without at least a tiny fleck of warmth tucked away. A secret spark whispering, I'm here, you're not alone. Okay, she said, weaving a few strands of her hair together to clam her twitchy fingers. She picked up the nervous habit years ago after her mom's accident, and the tiny braids were kind of her trademark now. I guess I should stop stalling and head down to deal with Sir Creepy Sparks, huh? Lynn smiled. Probably. Unless you want to rehearse what you're going to say. Nah, I'm just going to offer him an ugly flower that doesn't exactly need a big speech. Oh, but that reminds me. She reached into her cape pocket and pulled out the spiky dark blue Knox flare, which looked more like a dying weed than a super rare flower, and held it up to the guards. Mr. Forkle had already checked this before I brought it here to make sure it's safe for me to offer to Fenton, but I figure you want to check it too. We do, they agreed in unison, as one of the biggest, deadliest looking guards took the Nox Flare from Marilla and brought it over to the other goblins. A lot of mumbling about potentially kindling and fire hazards followed. Eventually, the guards decided to quick freeze the Nox Flare into a block of ice in case there's any heat stored inside. Whoa, Marilla said when the scary guard returned with the flower-filled ice cube, which had turned out as big as her head. How heavy is that thing? The guard studied Marilla's skinny arms. I can carry it for you, if you'd like. That'd probably be smart, Marilla was pretty sure she'd drop Drop it, or her fingers would freeze off during the long walk, and use telekinesis would drain her mental energy. But can you stay out of sight? I was planning to tell Fenton he could only see his weird flower thing if he gives me access to his memories. And that's kind of ru ruined if there's a giant goblin holding it right next to me. Not that it made my plan any less pointless. Fenton was obviously going to turn her down. He'd already made it super clear that the only trade he was interested in was for his freedom, which was never going to happen. Marilla doubted a dying flower frozen in ice was suddenly going to make him be like, you know what? Who needs out of this horrible prison when I can have that? But she was out of other ideas, and Sophie wanted her to try the Knox Flare thing, so whatever. Marilla didn't care about Sophie's current power trip the way Stina did, as long as she didn't have to be the one coming up with all the plans or almost dying all the time. Marilla was fine following orders, especially if she got to say I told you so when they turned out to be a huge waste of time. Sure you don't want me to come with you, Lynn asked, as Marilla pulled thick gloves onto her hands. Fenton likes me. Marilla wasn't sure if like was the right word since Fenton didn't seem to like anybody, but he'd definitely been impressed with Lynn. He demanded to speak with the hydrokinetic after Marilla mentioned she practiced her pyrokinesis with Lynn. So Marilla had convinced the goblin guards to let Lynn down into the prison, and when Fenton asked for a demonstration of Lynn's ability to ensure she wouldn't hinder his training, Lynn had stirred up all the ice shards on his floor and made them rain around him like he was trapped inside a snow globe, which actually made him applaud. Apparently, most hydrokinetics struggle to manipulate water in its solid form and were limited to liquid water or water vapor, but not Lynn, of course. Marilla was pretty sure that Lynn was more powerful than any of her other friends. Well, if you need me, you know where to find me, Lynn said, as Marilla forced her feet to carry her into the cave. I'll just be here making another snow menagerie. She flicked her wrist and wove the hovering snowflakes into a soaring Alanon. Ugh, at least make some ugly creatures this time, Marilla called over her shoulder. I want to see a row of snow ghouls when I get back here, or a giant Princess Purifins. Lynn gasped. Princess Purifins is not ugly. I'm going to tell her you said that. Marilla laughed, I'm sure you will. She would have teased Lynn more about her ridiculous obsession with her pet Murcat, but the frigid air from the prison hit Marilla hard, and she had to lock her jaw to keep her teeth from chattering. At least she didn't have to make the journey by herself this time. Marilla could have heard the scary goblin guard keeping pace several steps behind her as her eyes slowly adjusted to the dim blue light cast by a series of glowing spheres dangling from the ceiling. The downward slope grew steeper with each winding curve, and Marilla was always tempted to try sliding down the icy floor instead of walking, but she'd probably end up crashing into one of those weird ice thrones outside Fenton's cell, and she knew better than anyone that injuries couldn't always be healed. Plus, the trudge gave her a chance to add extra defenses to the heat she tucked away in her chest. She'd often wondered if Fenton had hidden a few sparks of his own when he was arrested. After all, he had to know the council would have put him on ice for the rest of eternity. Wouldn't he try to preserve what little heat he could? But Marilla had stretched out her senses a zillion different ways and never felt the slightest tingle of warmth when she was around him. So either there was nothing to find, or Fenton was that good. She had a horrible feeling it was the latter, and he was waiting for just the right moment to reveal his grand plan. But 
that wasn't the kind of thing she should be thinking about before having to face him. Still, she spent the next few turns trying to figure out what she'd do if she were right. Her feet turned numb while she was plotting, and her bones were officially aching by the time the path widened, the only warning that they were getting close to Fenton's cell. A few curves later, his cage came into view, a stark, icy bubble in the center of, of a circular cavern. The round wall was reflective on the inside, so even though Marilla could see Fenton pacing along the edge of his frozen barricade, he wouldn't be able to see her until she triggered the sensor by sitting in one of the freezing thrones positioned at the only point Fenton could peer through. He looked extra tired that day, his sky blue eyes sunken by more shadows than usual, and he kept muttering under his breath about incompetence as he tucked his messy blonde hair behind his pointy ears with a bit more force than necessary. Merla glanced back at the scary guard, making sure that he ducked into the shadows near the back of the cell before she made her big appearance. Then she took a deep breath and pressed her hand against her heart, reaching for her secret spark of warmth one last time before plopping into the closest ice throne. Aw, looks like you missed me, she said, tossing back her hair and flashing her brightest smile. She'd like to start her visits by showing Fenton she wasn't afraid of him, even if she totally was. But Fenton didn't glance her way. I'm not in the mood for games, he warned as he continued his slow march around his cell. Neither am I, Merla assured him, deciding that wasn't her cue to start with the cash. She sat up taller, trying to look extra confident as she added, but I do have an awesome trade to offer you. Fenton sighed. If this is about my cash, I already told you what I'm willing to accept. Unless you're here to grant me a day of freedom, I'm definitely not, but I found something you should like even better. She paused, hoping the extra bit of anticipation would somehow make her offer sound more excited when she told him it Knox flares. Fenton scrunched his slender nose. What are Knox flares, and why would I care about them? Marilla tilted her head, trying to tell if he was faking. She hadn't expected him to jump around or applaud or anything, but she'd expected him to at least know what Knox flares were. Then again, his mind had been shattered and pieced back together so many times, his memories had to be in shambles, and ancient minds tended to be a total mess anyways, since they were crammed with thousands of years of information in the past and present blurred together. Would it help if I told you I stopped by your old estate on my way here? She asked. Your garden could use some gnomish help by the way. All the plants have turned into a giant dying tangle. But I dug around and managed to find the scraggly vine with dark pointy flowers and I heard that plant is special to you so I picked a few and... You picked my Nox flares? Fenton snapped, rushing to the wall of the cell and pressing his palms against the ice. You must let me see them. Merle's lips curled into a huge smirk. I thought you didn't know what they were. Fenton gritted his teeth so hard it sounded like cracking ice. Hey, I'm not saying I won't share, but it'll cost you and I'm pretty sure you can already guess what I want. She paused for another beat before she added, just so we're clear, I'll show you one of your Knox flares if you open your cache and show me what's inside. Fenton's jaws tightened even more and his hands curled into fists, but he didn't say no. He didn't say anything, which was definitely new. Marella had already offered him a long list of trade suggestions that she, Lynn, Maraca, and Stina had all come up with some really cool ones, and Fenton had shot each one down before she could even finish the offer. She couldn't believe he looked so tempted by an ugly flower. But as the silence dragged on, Marilla started to wonder if she misread the situation. Maybe she pushed him too hard, taunted him too much, and now Fenton was letting her sit there in the cold knowing the icy throne was turning her butt and legs numb. She was trying to decide if she could make standing up look like a power move when Fenton told her, fine, you have a deal, but since you're only offering one Knox Flare, I'll only show you one memory. Marilla barely stopped herself from blurting out, Seriously? Or, she said instead, wanting to kick herself for not bringing more Knox Flares with her. The whole thing had just seemed so silly, and the first few she'd already picked had crumbled to dust. But the vine had lots more flowers, so she could fix the mistake super easily. How about I go back, grab eight more Knox Flares, and then you show me all nine memories? Fenton grinned, tempting but one Knox Flare is really all I need. Need? Rilla wasn't a fan of that wording, but before she could ask him what he needed it for, he added, my offer expires in 10 seconds and started counting down. By six, she decided that one memory was better than nothing. Fine, she said, pulling the cash from her pocket and holding the marble-sized orb up to the light, but you go first. How do I open this thing? No way was she going to risk letting him back out, especially since he probably wasn't going to be happy when he saw his precious flower was stuck in the middle of a giant ice cube. Fenton held out his hands. Give me the cash and I'll open it. Marilla laughed. Hard pass. Ah, but you don't have a choice. I'm the only one who can access the memories and I need to make physical contact with the cache in order to do so. Marilla squinted at the tiny gadget. She didn't know much about caches aside from each fact that only counselors used them and that each colorful inner crystal held a single forgotten secret. But she did know that Dex had already tried everything he could think of to open the cache and failed, and he was one of the best technopaths ever. Do I need to start counting again? Fenton asked. I believe we got into five. Marilla chewed her lip. 
Uh, how do I know you're not going to destroy the cash or try to hold it for ransom or something? Fenton's smile was colder than his cell. You'll just have to trust me. Yeah, I don't see that happening. Fenton shrugged, then our deal is off. Marilla rolled her eyes. Come on, even if I wanted to, it's not like I can open your cell door and hand the cash to you. She wasn't even sure if his cell had a door. The wall looked like one big solid piece of ice. You've proven to be very resourceful during our lessons, Fenton reminded her. Yeah, but it's your call, he interrupted. If you want a memory, you'll have to trust me. She snort laughed. But before she could get another word out, he repeated, you'll just have to trust me. And she could tell that was the only response he was going to give. She turned to the scary guards who had startled pacing the shadows. Is there a way to pass Fenton a small item? Ah, you have a hidden goblin escort. I knew you were resourceful. Fenton clapped his hands. And yes, there is a way to pass me my cash. Otherwise, I wouldn't have suggested it. Any guard can open the disgraceful tube they pass my horrid frozen bits of food through. The cash should fit nicely. The guard gripped his sword. I cannot allow any unauthorized item to enter his cell. Fenton clicked his tongue. Clearly, you're not considering the fact that I've already had plenty of chances to make this trade and turn them all down. Do you think I would do that if the cash was even right? remotely useful to me. The goblin couldn't argue with that logic, neither could Morella. And when Fenton went back to counting down, she told the guard, the black swan knows I've been trying to make this trade and they're working with the council now. No one would let me do this if they thought the cash was dangerous. Then again, they'd never discussed the possibility of handing the cash over to Fenton, but surely someone must have considered that during all their endless talking and obsessive over planning, right? Besides, if anything went wrong, she could always remind them that this was Sophie's idea. I don't like this, the scary guard growled, but Morella gave him her, I totally know what I'm doing glare until he's until he set the frozen Knox flare down with a particularly dramatic thud, snatched the cash, and spent an eternity squinting at the tiny crystal, spinning it all different ways. If anything happens, my priority will be subduing the prisoner, not protecting you. Are you certain you want to take that risk? Morella absolutely wasn't. But this might be their only shot at seeing one of Vincent's forgotten secrets. Plus, she had her tiny little spark buddy she could call on if she needed. Surely she could use that to, to what? Take down a super powerful, much more experienced pyrokinetic with a history of murdering people? But she didn't really want to wimp out. Sophie wouldn't. And yeah, Sophie had like a permanent bed in the healing center. But Morella was pretty sure their whole group would vote, do it. There was also a dozen other armed goblins who would rush down as backup. And Lynn could attack Vincent with her cutesy snow animals. It'd almost be worth it to watch Fenton get swallowed up by an ice wave shaped like Princess Perifins. I can handle myself, she decided, using a tone that hopefully sounded intimidating. Fenton's gleeful laughter echoed off the ice. The scary guard muttered something about the arrogance of elves as he reached toward the top of Fenton's frozen cell, felt around for a specific spot, a faint clicking sound followed and a tiny round door slid open far out of Fenton's reach. I can neutralize you within seconds, the guard reminded him as he held the cash up to the opening by numerous means, some far more painful than others. Yes, I'm well aware of the absurd lengths the council has taken to keep me contained, Fenton assured him, but I don't plan on giving you a reason to use any of them, not today at least. The guard bared his super sharp pointy teeth and Marilla wanted to shout, never mind, just kidding, but she let the guard shove the cash through the tiny opening and then it was too late to change her mind. All she could do was watch the glass orb make its slow descent, rolling around and around and around down some sort of invisible path etched into the wall of the cell. Her stomach backflipped with each rotation and she felt more than a little vomity when the cash dropped low enough for Fenton to catch it. But he simply held it up and studied it. Then he coughed on it and sneezed on it. Ew, Marilla groaned when he followed that up by drilling on it. You know there are better ways to give it your DNA. Yes, I'm aware, Fenton cleared his throat and launched a slimy blob of spit at the cash. I also know your little technopath friend is going to ask how I access the memory, so feel free to give him a detailed list. He wiped the cash dry with his fingers, and then ran it through his greasy hair before sneezing and coughing on it again. Some of these methods are vital, some are distractions. None can be recreated without me, but it'll be fun if he tries, don't you think? He laughed so hard it brought tears to his eyes, and he smeared them across the cash before sneezing and spitting on it again, making Marilla very glad she had gloves to keep her hands clean once he returned the cash, assuming she actually got it back. She tried to make out what he was saying when he started mumbling a bunch of stuff in the crystal, but the words were all mushed together. He also tapped the cash in so many different places that she doubted even Sophie and Keith with their fancy photographic memories would be able to recreate the patterns. And he looked so smug as he did it all that Marilla decided to look as bored as possible which was why she was barely paying attention when the cash flared to life, projecting a small hologram of Fenton staying alone in a wide empty field. Huh, Marilla mumbled. Gotta admit, I was expecting something a little more excited than a tiny glowing Fenton in the middle of nowhere doing nothing. Then you should learn to be more observant, Fenton pointed to the swaying grass around the hologram's feet. And after a few seconds, Marilla realized there was a vine of blooming Knox flares. I figured I'd show you what Knoxlers can do, since you're so generously bringing one back into my life. Marilla squinted at the tiny flowers, waiting for something to happen. 
and waiting and waiting. So they blow in the wind, she asked? Fenton sighed. No, they do this. The hologram of Fenton waved his arms and all the Hanox flares erupted with searing white flames. E yeah, still not seeing why this needed to be a super hush-hush forgotten secret, Marilla grumbled as the Fenton hologram flickered his wrist and added purple fire to the white. Sure, the flames were pretty, but all the flames were beautiful. Try thinking like a pyrokinetic, Fenton snapped. Tell me, are there any other flowers that can remain intact under such an inferno? Marilla couldn't think of any. And the Nox flares still didn't burn when the Fenton hologram added yellow flames to the fiery mix. But other than clearly being fire resistant, Marilla didn't see the Nox flares actually doing anything, and the hologram of Fenton must have been equally unimpressed. He frowned at the flaming petals and dragged a hand down his face, mumbling, something's missing. Still not seeing the point of this, Marilla noted. I mean, the voice trailed off as a tiny Fenton waved his arms again and blasted the Nox flares with pink flames, which made the flowers spray sparks in every direction. The effect was breathtaking, kind of like the sky during the celestial festival, but that still didn't necessarily scream, this memory is important. How come the grass isn't catching fire, she asked, grasping for anything that might be significant. Do the Nox flares protect it or something? No, I was protecting it. A pyrokinetic should always be in control of their flames. He sounded so smug, Marilla was tempted to remind him that he let five pyrokinetics die when he tried to teach them how to call down Everblaze, and they all lost control. But that would probably make him throw one of his tantrums and send her away. Tantrums and send her away. She needed the cash back first, and hopefully find something useful in this boring memory. Sadly, all Fenton's hologram did was stare blankly at the stars and mumble, something's missing, again before the image flashed away. That's it? The scary guard demanded, beating Marilla to the complaint. Yeah, so you put on a little fire show all by herself with some spark shooting flowers, she added, trying to sum up what she's seen. You were clearly disappointed by that little show, and then you must have remembered what you needed to. She waved her hands, cueing Fenton to fill in the blanks with whatever she was missing. But he just stood there, staring at the cache with the same glazed look he always got whenever he started, rambling about the beauty of fire. And Marilla wished Lynn had come with her after all. Lynn could pelt him with snowballs or something to snap him out of it. But then she realized, you never figured out what was missing, did you? Fenton blinked and met her gaze. The Nox flares are full of possibility, but they need to burn. That doesn't answer my questions, Marilla noted. Fenton shrugged. Context was not part of our bargain. Yeah, because I figured when I saw the memory, it would be obvious why it's this big forgotten secret. How does you setting some flowers on fire and then realizing you did it wrong matter to anyone. I did nothing wrong, Fenton assured her, with a particularly haughty smile. But Morella wasn't buying it. There was a tightness around his eyes that was too familiar. Her dad had the same tightness every time her mom was having one of her bad days and she knew exactly what it meant. Disappointment, frustration, a hint of helplessness. So she marched over to the guard and grabbed the frozen Nox flare from the floor, too irritated to even notice how heavy the ice must have been as she hauled it back. She popped it in front of Fenton's cell. Ta-da! One ugly flower as promised, and I'm sure you're not surprised that I had to freeze it before I brought it down here. I'm not. Fenton dropped to his knees and gazed at the Nox flare like he was seeing a long lost friend. He pressed his hands against the cell, trying to get as close as he could. Such power, such promise. Uh-huh, Marilla agreed, letting him stare and stare, hoping it would help him let his guard down. When his eyes turned a little teary, she went in for the kill. But there is something still missing, isn't there? That's why you saved this memory, to remind yourself to keep looking. A whole lot of painful sounds passed before Fenton slowly nodded. Marilla wanted to feel triumphant, but all she'd done was prove the entire trade had been pointless. There was no game-changing clue, no dirty little secret about the past, certainly nothing to help them stop their enemies. And she had a pretty strong hunch the other eight memories in the cache would be just as ridiculous. The answer is out there, Fenton murmured. I can feel it. I just can't grasp it, perhaps. Perhaps, Marilla prompted when his eyes locked with hers. Fenton stepped closer to the ice, keeping his voice low, like he didn't want the guard to hear him. Perhaps a different pyrokinetic is meant to find the truth, one who already convinced the council to trust her. Marilla laughed. The council doesn't trust me. The fact that you're here for a pyrokinesis lesson says otherwise, particularly since the lesson is with me. He started circling the cell again, mumbling under his breath and nodding. The only words Marilla caught were possible, improvising, and best option. After three more times around the cell, he stopped in front of Marilla again, leaning even closer to the icy wall as he whispered, I believe it's time for me to offer a trade of my own. A trade, Marilla repeated, not missing the way that the scary guard gripped his sword. Fenton glared at him. This conversation is between me and my prodigy. She stands here of her own free will, shielded by who knows how many different kinds of protections, and she can leave anytime she pleases. Your presence is no longer needed. You still have her gadget, the guard argued. I said, pose I do, but that can be easily remedied. And then set the cash on whatever invisible ledge it had, slid down in the first place, and gave it a good shove, sending it spinning up the path toward the top of the cell. The guard had to scramble to catch it when it launched out of the ice bubble. See, Fenton said, shifting his gaze back to Marilla, I can be trusted. Pretty sure the only thing I can trust is that you'll do what's best for you, Marilla countered. As long as you get what you 
you want? Why would you care? After all, no matter what, I'm still stuck in here, aren't I? He waved his arms around his little ice bubble, which suddenly looked way less secure than it had during her other visits. Oh, relax. All I'm asking it for is a little information. Merla crossed her arms. Right. And information has never got anyone hurt or killed. It's not that kind of secret. It's, he frowned. Honestly, I don't know what it is. And for someone my age with my connections, that says something, doesn't it? I doubt any of the Vactors even know the full truth. Then how am I supposed to find it, Merla demanded. As I said, you're proven to be quite resourceful, particularly when you team up with your little friends. He scowled at the guard again before motioning her to step closer until her ear was practically pressed up against the ice. A voice in the back of her head kept screaming, why are you listening to him? But she was curious, and there was nothing wrong with hearing his offer, was there? Benton's breath fogged the ice, obscuring his face as he whispered, all I ask is that if you ever find out what's missing from the Nox flares, you share it with me. Why? Marilla glanced at the frozen flower, wishing she could see something more than just ugly, shriveled petals. Because I want to know, Fenton said simply. Because I can give you what you want in return. The rest of the memories in your cache, Marilla clarified. Fenton nodded. Then his lips curled into a smile. In one other. Something you've long wondered about, even though you probably don't admit it to yourself. Marilla raised one eyebrow, refusing to show any more interest in that. Fenton cupped his hands around his mouth and pressed them to the ice before he whispered. I know what happened to your mother. Marilla sucked in a breath. Yes, Fenton added. I'm talking about her accident, if we can really call it that. I know why she fell, and why her injuries were so incurable. Marilla stumbled back, collapsing into the nearest throne and hugging herself to stop her body from shaking with tremors that had nothing to do with the cold. A tiny, terrified part of her had always thought the story she'd been told about her mom's fall hadn't totally made sense. But everyone, everyone was convinced that it had been an accident, even her father. And if it wasn't, she leaned toward Fenton. I don't need your games. Oh, this definitely isn't a game. But it's the only way you'll ever know the truth, and before you start overthinking everything, consider this. You have all the power here. Make the trade, don't make the trade, it's totally your call. You also don't have to make a decision right away. I'm trapped in this prison, I'll never find the answer on my own. And I'll never know if you find the answer unless you decide to tell me. So there's zero pressure. No one even knows we've had this conversation, and don't worry about the guard. See how frustrated he looks? That's because I made sure he only heard what I wanted him to hear. The rest is our little secret. Our little secret? Benton was probably the last person she should have a secret with, and yet he had a point. No one knew he'd made her this offer, and it wasn't like she'd come to any decision. She didn't even have the information Benton wanted anyway. And with the way their investigations always seem to go, she'd probably only find a whole lot more questions. So there was really no point in telling anyone about this. She could tell them when she needed to, if she needed to. That wouldn't be wrong, would it? It didn't feel wrong, or it wouldn't have if Fenton's smile wasn't so creepy. I'm not agreeing to anything, she said, wanting to make that very clear. You're not, Fenton assured her, so how about we put this out of your mind and get started with our lesson? I'm sure your hydrokinetic friend is wondering why you haven't come up to practice it. Lynn was probably starting to worry. She'd probably also built enough snow animals to make a frozen sanctuary. Fine, Marilla said, standing up and dusting ice off her cape. What do you want me to work on today? How about I teach you how to make those colored flames you saw in the memory? Fenton suggested. You know, in case that ever comes in handy? He winked, and the guard groaned and held out the cash to Marilla. Sounds like I'm no longer needed. You aren't, Fenton agreed. The guard growled, looking scarier than ever, and turned to march away, but he spun back after a few steps. He's right that I don't know what he offered you, but I can tell you're tempted, and I hope you're smart enough to reject it. Never make a deal with someone who has nothing to lose. I'm not, Marilla promised, and she wasn't. She hadn't made any decisions except to keep this to herself, but that didn't mean anything. She was just trying to avoid a ton of drama and arguing and having people give her advice she didn't need. Plus, everyone has secrets. Shoot, the great Sophie Foster had more secrets than anyone. So it was fine. Everything was fine, nothing had changed, time to focus on controlling her fire. And yet for the rest of the lesson, the tiny spark in her heart burned hotter and hotter and hotter, whispering a new plea, trust me, trust me, trust me.